This is the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live, where we offer the news, information, traffic, weather, sports, and entertainment for our commercial drivers. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. Many of our drivers have the daily trial of dealing with chronic pain in their legs, their back, and other areas. It can become so hard to deal with. Drivers are not alone in this. Chronic pain affects about 130 million Americans. Constant pain for many people becomes unbearable, and people seek a solution that does not involve surgery or pain medications. We decided to consult with a pain expert to help our driver listeners. Dr. Mitchell Yass is the creator of the Yass Method for Diagnosing and Treating Chronic Pain. He's used this method for over 20 years to treat thousands of patients in resolving pain and returning them to full functional capacity. He stopped thousands of people from getting unnecessary surgeries and resolved the pain of thousands of others who had surgery that did nothing to help with their pain. Welcome, Dr. Yas. Thank you for being on the show with us today. Thanks for having me, Shelley. I am very excited to share my information with the truckers out there and to show them that they can actually have control over their pain, that they are not dependent on a medical establishment. Oh, would that be wonderful. You know, Dr. Yas, you've had an interesting background. I see it started in the construction industry, and you had a lot of knowledge of strength training and weightlifting that got you into the field you're in today. You eventually went into physical therapy, and then you developed your famous Yas method of strength training to eliminate pain for your patients. I understand your techniques also been featured on PBS. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how all this evolved? So the... Development of the Yas method actually starts with me as a child being this very thin kid, that 99 pound weakling who had sand kicked in his face. And I decided I was going to change my life by strength training. So from 19 to 26, I did everything Joe Weider and Arnold Schwarzenegger told me to do. And I took whey protein and nothing helped. And then at 26, I realized that strength training probably related to physics because you're pushing against gravity and gravity is a force vector. And I had remembered that I had taken a high school physics course. So I started applying the laws of physics, force vectors, fulcrum arms, levers, all these different physics laws. And over the next four years, I put 40 pounds of muscle on. I go from 160 to 200 pounds. So I have developed this very unique understanding of strength training. During this period of time, I became disillusioned with my occupation as a project manager in construction and was looking for another occupation. And I heard about this thing called physical therapy. And so I decided to go into that. It was during that educational process that I realized that the primary mechanism that is used to identify the cause of pain is the MRI and or the X-ray. Right. And these diagnostic tests find structural variations in the back, a herniated discs, a pinched nerve, arthritis in the knee, a meniscal tear or arthritis. And because they're identified at the time of the pain, they are asserted to be the cause of the pain. It is important to understand that that basis of differentiating that as the cause is called correlative theory or junk science. It is the equivalent of saying, if I open my front door when the sun rises, I could say opening my front door causes the sun to rise. <laughs> Clearly not true and simply insane. And yet that is the basis by which diagnostics were done. So as I'm having people in front of me, as I come to the end of my education, I'm starting to realize that the most logical thing to do is ask somebody could you just point to where your pain is? Could you show me where your pain is? Because that would be a rather important thing to understand. Sure. And what I find is in that in more than 98% of cases that I'm treating, the pain is not where it should be if the identified structural variation were to elicit pain. So if the pain is not where it should be, if the structural variation were to elicit pain, then by definition, the structural variation cannot be the cause of the pain. So I decide to take a path away from accepting diagnostic test findings and began to interpret the symptoms themselves. And what I found was that in 98% of cases of people I've treated over the last 30 years, the cause was muscular. 
the important thing to understand are muscular causes cannot show up on diagnostic tests, which is why those who are treating based on diagnosing through MRIs cannot find muscular causes, which allows them to remain the muscle in distress, allowing them to continue to elicit pain throughout whatever treatment is provided. And that is the basis of my method. And that is the basis why chronic pain exists. Interesting. You will hear from doctors now that the muscles are, are just reacting to these, a muscular skeletal situation, whether you have disc degeneration or spondylitis or various other conditions, and they still don't provide the answers. They'll put you into physical therapy. And a lot of times, maybe the physical therapy isn't exactly what you need, um, or they'll recommend things like neck fusions and back fusions. And I've heard people say they were worse off after the surgery. Yes. Yeah, so could we, I, I always like to use examples because I think okay. examples, um, people, people can relate to them. So this person decides to bend down, they drop their pen and they decide to bend down and pick it up off the floor. And all of a sudden their back goes into spasm and they're rushed to the, to the hospital, right? Mm -hmm. They get an MRI. It finds a herniated disc. And since the herniated disc is found at the time of the back pain, it is asserted to be the cause of the pain. Now, I am a logician by trade. I was taught logical thinking. So let's think about this. What that says is that if the herniated disc caused that pain, the very second before that pain began, the disc is not herniated. So what that's saying is that bending down and picking up a pen can just arbitrarily herniate a disc. Does anyone think that that's a valid premise? No. Pretty silly, right? Yeah. So the other part of looking at the herniated disc would be this, the, her the, uh, the MRI. The MRI only was taken after the pain, and it's always done after the pain occurs. Sure. Let me ask you, do you think if the MRI was done prior to that bending down, would, an, would a herniated disc have been found? The answer is, of course. They are degenerative in nature, and they take years to develop. Mm-hmm. So you have to appreciate that the mere identification of the herniated disc means nothing in terms of recognizing what is creating that pain. So let's look at the mechanism. The person was bending down. That is a form of activity. Most people will tell you that their pain is associated with activity. What tissue was most associated with activity? Did the kidney allow you to bend down? Did the <laughs> liver allow you to bend down? I'm going to guess it was your muscle. Right. So once a person associates their pain with activity, you have basically identified the fact that the tissue in distress is muscle. Okay. So let's go to your theory. Oh, well, the muscle is just responding to the disc. So my question to that is, well, how do you know these people that say that? How do you know that the muscle is responding to the disc or whether the muscle just decided to strain on its own because it wasn't capable of supporting you during bending down? How does that person know that? Where is the identifying factor? Right. The answer is there isn't any. It's just made up. Right. It's just arbitrary. Right. Mm -hmm. So. You want to, if you want to accept the idea that muscle can cause pain, again, we have to go to the fact that almost all the cases I've treated over 30 years, the person has associated their pain with activity. And most importantly, that when they sit down, rest, or stop doing the activity that irritates them, the pain declines or resolves, right? So right. if it was a herniated disc causing the muscle to react, isn't the herniated disc always the herniated disc? And therefore, shouldn't that person have pain 24 hours a day? Yeah. But they don't. They only have it when it's associated with activity and rest reduces the pain. That certainly sounds more like it's a muscle. Mm -hmm. So the other points to understand about the YAS method's ability to diagnose is that it's not just pain that is the indicator that it's muscle. Muscles are responsible for posture. And for activity. So let's go to this person. Let's say it was their left lower back muscle that went into spasm because it, there was some other muscle that was supposed to help in supporting that person as they bent down and it wasn't available. That led that muscle to strain. Well, muscles are responsible for posture and the, the lower back muscle may be 
strained because of muscle that supports the pelvis. The, the, there are muscles that support the pelvis and the muscles that support the lower back, and they must work synergistically. So if one muscle that supported the pelvis was weak, it caused the low back muscle to overwork and strain, there would be an alteration in the heights of the pelvis because one muscle on one side of the body is weaker than the other. Well, the YAS method would identify that as a corroborating factor, that one height of the pelvis is different than the other side. That could only happen, and this is, again is an important thing for people to understand, bones do not determine their position. When someone has forward head posture, like they're looking down, or mm -hmm. someone has an excessive arch, or somebody has one side of the pelvis higher than the other, that wasn't because the bone just decided that they, you know what? I feel like getting crazy. I'm going to just switch my position, mm -hmm. right? That's right. not going to happen. It's going to be because muscles attach to bones and muscles determine bone position. Proper posture relates to strength and balance of muscle. Improper posture relates to weakness or some sort of imbalance. So there are corroborating indicators that would tell me it's muscle. And once you do identify its muscle, then you have to understand which muscles are involved and how to do the appropriate type of strengthening. And what do you know? That proper type of strengthening was the basis by which I personally put on 60 pounds of muscle, self-taught and relating to physics. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I've done as based on a curriculum. It is self-taught. And that's what gives the YAS methods its advantage to get people out of pain in a treatment or two treatments. We talk about weeks getting out of pain, not months or years. Oh, wow. That's encouraging in and of itself, because so often people are stuck with chronic pain for years and it's exhausting. And they just think that that's just the way they have to live. And they don't get the, the kind of concrete answers they always want from the doctors, I think. Yeah. I, I, and so could, could I, this is all right. So um, about four years ago, I found enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think in the now, I live in the now, and it's been tremendous in my help in understanding how things are, what they are. And enlightenment teaches us that there's two parts to the brain, the thinking brain and the acting brain. The thinking brain pertains to thoughts from the past and the future. The acting brain pertains to the thoughts in the now. So you just had that situation arise. You went down, you you would Pick, trying to pick up a pen, you pulled your back. You end up in front of a neurologist or an orthopedist. What? And this gets a little hard to appreciate, but it is a fact, and, and it would make sense to you if, if you think about it in this regard. That person that you're seeking care from is 100% working through their thinking brain. That is to say that they are not looking at you at this moment. And I think people would acknowledge this. They're not really asking them to bend forward and twist and get a full understanding of the history of the pain and what brings it on and what doesn't bring it on and looking at posture and all these other things. They're basically going back to their thinking brain and saying, this is how I was educated 15 sure. years ago. This is what I do. It is exactly what I do because this is my thinking brain and there's nothing that relates to the future, the existing situation. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. most treatment is pri provided through the thinking brain, not out of malice. It's not intentional. It's simply the fact that the person simply hasn't reached enlightenment to the point where they could exist in the now. The YAS method basically looks at that person standing in front of them in the moment. Every word spoken has value, has validity. Every aspect of the individual has to be taken into account to understand what tissue is in distress, eliciting the symptoms being experienced. Because if you don't find the tissue, you can treat it appropriately with the appropriate intervention, and therefore it never stops being in distress and eliciting the symptom. And so I think that most people would say when they go to their physician and seek care for pain, I mean, I, I've treated thousands of people. They all say the same thing. They don't listen to me. Mm -hmm. They're not listening to me. They don't hear me. They don't pay attention to me. And, and the basic premise behind that is they are working in their thinking brain, not their acting brain. The YAS method is based 100% by living in the 
acting brain in the now, understanding what's happening at that moment. The, I, I, I don't think I've ever touched a person without having some sort of communication with them for at least a half hour, 45 minutes. Okay, well, and that's a lot more than uh, you get from uh, <laughs> a, a doctor's visit. That's usually what, uh, if you're lucky, 20 minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I could see where it would be harder to get a full understanding of what the patient's going through. Well, well. Uh, also, what if your thinking brain simply tells you that the basis by diagnosis is the resultant from the MRI? That, in fact, what if the person's completely on fire? Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean anything to me because I only know from my thinking brain that I was taught to look at the results of the MRI to make a diagnosis. So if they were on fire, so I don't, I don't even see them on fire. Right. I'm just going to look at the result of that MRI, whatever it says, that's what I do. And that's because they stay in their thinking brain. Sure. And that's their orientation and their training. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Which limits yeah. them and looking at other possibilities. I, I could see that for sure. And by the way, it's very important for people to understand. So I am Dr. Mitchell Yas with a doctorate in physical therapy, but it has got to be made clear that the Yas method is not physical therapy. It is something that I developed after my educational background made me recognize that the way that physical therapy works is through the thinking brain. And the diagnosis derived for treatment typically in physical therapy is derived from the diagnosis of the referring physician. Who's the referring physician? The orthopedist, the neurologist. Where is the diagnosis derived? The MRI or X-ray. Yeah. So how is that treatment any tr different than the treatment from the neurologist or the orthopedist? Is there any attempt to look at the individual, to interpret the symptoms of the individual, to talk to the person? None of that. It's all standardized care. Standardized care from the education that was derived from the thinking brain in the past. And that is it. Uh, the, the standardized care, one size doesn't fit all. And, and well, it just makes sense to be able to work on an individual basis. Wouldn't that be nice? But I don't think that's the way our medical system set up. Well, it's certainly progressing to a farther and farther sense of it just being standardized. And mm -hmm. it is important to understand that the YAS method, because of its ability to interpret the presentation of symptoms, can tell whether the pain is coming from a bone, a nerve, or a muscle. That's who you want to come to. You To, to, to establish a cause you have to be able to go to someone who's in a position to identify all potential causes, Sure. right? Yep. If you go yep. to an orthopedist, how many times is he going to tell you you have a neurological problem? If you go to a neurologist, how many times is he going to tell you you have a podiatric problem, right? That's They're only going to tell you what they know. That's very true. Yeah. Right. That's their orientation. Of course. We have to go to break here, Dr. Yas. You've got some very refreshing and intriguing thoughts and insight here that I think our drivers are going to definitely benefit from. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio.Live. I'm speaking with Dr. Mitchell Yas. He's a renowned pain expert who's developed a Yas method for diagnosing and treating chronic pain. Stay tuned for more right here on TNC Radio.Live. The Truckers Network helps professional drivers save money and makes their lives easier. We were created for drivers by a commercial driver. We know the industry and driver needs. A Truckers Network membership offers exclusive discounts through our trusted partners on things like truck care, truck parking, tires, oil changes, fuel additives, fitness, roadside assistance, first aid kits, driver training, and a whole lot more. Start saving today. Check us out at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. That's app.thetruckersnetwork.net. The trucking industry keeps America running thanks to the 3.36 million professional truck drivers who deliver everyday goods to 80% of American communities who rely on trucking for that last mile. The industry represents a diverse group with nearly half of drivers at 42% as minorities. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, educates the public on the essentiality of trucking by telling the story of trucking and its positive impact on our economy, communities, and lives. Learn how you can join the industry movement by visiting truckingmovesamerica.com. Welcome back to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson, and I'm talking with Dr. Mitchell Yas. He's a renowned pain expert who developed the Yas method for diagnosing and treating chronic pain. 
Dr. Yas, you had mentioned in, during our break about sciatica. I know that's a huge issue for many drivers. What are your thoughts on that condition and what are the causes of it? So I would suggest it's not just drivers. There's roughly 40 million people in the United States suffering with sciatica. And that alone should tell you something's a little fishy about the way it is perceived to be caused by the medical establishment. And here's what we got. So sciatica, by definition, is pain. The symptom of sciatica is pain from the gluteal region down the back of the leg, beyond the knee, typically to the foot. That is standard sciatic symptom. Okay. One thing to note is that it's never in the back. I have treated so many people who were told that the cause of their pain was a herniated disc or stenosis or a pinched nerve in the lumbar spine. Yeah. And they would say to the doctor, but you keep saying it's from my back, but I have no back pain. That alone should be a red flag that that diagnosis makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's continue on. How did you get the diagnosis? You had sciatica. At the time of having sciatica, you got an MRI, which said you had a herniated did pinch nerve or stenosis. Therefore, since this, the pinch nerve or impingement or whatever was found at the time of the symptom, it is asserted to be the cause of the symptom. Again, this is correlative theory. It is 100% baseless to use that as a mechanism for diagnosing. So let's talk about what really is sciatica. I think most people would acknowledge sciatica represents irritation of the sciatic nerve, right? I don't think anyone's going to deny that issue, right? right? So where does the sciatic nerve begin and where does it end? Well, the spinal cord has nerve roots that come out of them at each level of the spine. Seven of those spinal nerve roots come out away from the spine and join together to, find, to begin the sciatic nerve in the gluteal region. Funny, the exact place where people complain of their pain beginning, right? Uh -huh. So it begins in the gluteal region and runs down the back of the leg to the knee where it bifurcates and becomes two different nerves. So the sciatic nerve begins in the gluteal region and ends at the back of the knee. So to have sciatica, you would have to assume you're going to have to irritate the nerve somewhere within its pathway. And the most common cause of irritation of the sciatic nerve is a muscle called the piriformis muscle, which runs from the sacral spine, the portion of the spine below the lumbar spine, runs diagonally across the gluteal region to the hip joint. In 30% of the population, the sciatic nerve actually perforates through that muscle. But what needs to understand, what people need to understand is that if a muscle strains, it has a tendency to thicken. And in thickening, because of the piriformis's proximity to the sciatic nerve, it can impinge upon it, okay. causing stimulation. So in most cases, sciatica is the result of a muscular cause creating a neurological symptom. Now, the MRI, this is very important to understand about sciatica. The MRI can only see the spinal cord and the nerve roots coming out. When the nerve roots form nerves in tissue such as muscle, the MRI cannot differentiate that nerve. In 2006, a man named Aaron Filler, a neurosurgeon in Cedar sinai Hospital in California, develops the MRN, Magnetic Resonance Neurography. It is a much higher powered MRI and actually can see nerves as they pass through tissue. Aaron Filler's study showed in more than 93% of cases of sciatica, the cause of pain is the piriformis muscle impinging on the sciatic nerve. Okay, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So we have diagnostic proof. Now, Aaron Filler's in the same boat as me. You know, nobody wants to hear that it's a muscle because you can't do surgery on muscle. You can't give epidural nerve blocks and pain medication. So he struggled to get his MRN out there but the fact is that where I don't know why you would want to trust the MRI, which cannot see the nerve, whereas the MRN can and has proved it is being impinged by that, yeah. by that muscle. So is the system kind of designed to stay the same because it's motivated to do surgeries? And Well, so I, I, don't, I don't look for maliciousness or anything like that. So the first thing you want to understand are certain natural premises, such as inertia. Mm-hmm. Things are as they are unless a force causes it to change or move. Right. 
that's got to be a really big force. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. So 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 that's part of the issue. Part of it is the fact that these practitioners are living and acting and treating in their thinking brain, which means that they are not addressing you in the moment. They're doing whatever they are based on their education from their past. Right. I, I, there's certainly a problem with the idea, and it's not the cause, but it's certainly a contributing factor is the idea of fee for service treatment. Mm -hmm. So let's say, for instance, you went for a five star dinner and the guy charged your steak. You're probably not paying for that. You yeah. went to have the mechanic fix your car. You turn it on and it doesn't go. You're probably not paying for that. You have lower back pain. You have a five level fusion. You have worse pain after. And that guy gets paid. That's right. Yeah. So that is certainly a contributing factor. So. I can only see it from my position as this guy who's become enlightened and lives in this place where I treat people on and based on what they're presenting at the moment. And um, I basically ignored my prior treatment. And the only uh, use that I have for what I do is based on my education that I developed empirically by treating people mm -hmm. and creating theory. And so when we talk about this idea of sciatica, you want to try to say to yourself, well, what would cause the piriformis muscle to strain and impinge on the nerve? Well, it turns out, and this really relates to the driver, um, is that there is a muscle on the side of the pelvis called the gluteus medius muscle. And it is responsible for you when weight bearing to provide stability and balance. Or if you're having to push those pedals all the time to stabilize your pelvis so the muscles of the leg can push you, your, move your legs so you can push the pedals while driving, right? Well, if that gluteus medius is weak and strains, the muscle that sits right next to it is the piriformis muscle. So the body has decided on a hierarchy of use that if the gluteus medius strains, the piriformis must try to assist. And since it's not in a position based on its angle of pull to help provide balance and stability of the pelvis, it will strain. So the cause of sciatica in almost all cases is a weak gluteus medius muscle on the side of the pelvis, which is causing the piriformis to compensate and strain. Now, does that happen just by, um, say, in, a, in the case of a driver, just by sitting all the time? Does it mean so, that? Yeah. So, so, so let's talk about this idea. Mm -hmm. You know, Pri uh, driving is unique because that's been around for quite a while. But when we talk about the essence of chronic pain, chronic pain began in the mid to late 1980s. There was no chronic pain prior in the history of mankind. And the reason for it was the development of automation, computers, phones, and all this other stuff to where activities, jobs, occupations, recreational activities all started being done less manually. Right. Now, it is critical to understand muscles are designed to offset the forces of gravity so that you can do activity. You're always pushing against gravity to do whatever activity you're trying to do. So That's muscles true. are required to push against that. So gravity is pushing down a force requirement. Muscles push up force output. If the force output of the muscle is less than the force requirement of the activity, the muscle is going to strain and it could lead to compensation and pain. Well, that gluteus medius muscle is responsible for support, supporting you against gravity. You're now sitting for eight to 10 hours a day. You're not using that muscle. That's a muscle true. not used loses its ability to create force. When you then go decide to use it, its force output is less than the force requirement of the activity. You will strain and you become more susceptible to straining and eliciting symptoms. Okay. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, uh, what is it, the statement, use it or lose it? <laughs> Muscles so, atrophy, don't they? Yeah. So, so you're hitting on really the essence of this is, so this is what happens with me. I keep, I keep telling people you need to do strain train. You need to strain train. So everyone will come back to me and say, well, nobody in the history of mankind strain train. There wasn't history. There wasn't strength training during the Roman period. Right. No one was doing lat pull downs and leg press and all right. Or the Greeks. Are, so why now? The answer is because throughout the history of mankind, activity was done 
multi-directionally, which is what you do with activity. So all muscle strengths were sustained at that level of force requirement. So if you did a manual job, unless you took off for some substantial period of time, the force requirement remained generally the same because you were doing the same job and the force output of your muscles was sustained because you were using them. So that was the perfect balance. So therefore nobody was straining and eliciting pain. Once we hit the mid to late 1980s with automation, what's the number one job in the world right now? IT, information technology, everybody's sitting eight to 10 hours, right? Look at the people who were doing it, 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, right? Sure. What you started to see from the 1980s on was primarily the people suffering from pain prior to that were retired people, right? What happened with them? They retired and they got in the rocking chair and sat on the on the porch and did nothing. So they were susceptible to pain. They called it rheumatism, which it really wasn't. It was just straining, right? Now yeah. you have all populations from the teens, 20s, all the way to the 80s and 90s susceptible to pain because their ability to perform their manual activity has been decimated by the lack of use of the muscles required for pushing against gravity. That was the basis for the massive extension of people suffering with pain. It became chronic because during that evolutionary period, that technological period, the MRI developed and was incapable of identifying the muscular causes responsible. That's why it went from just a massive number of people suffering to now massive numbers of people suffering from chronic pain. Sure. I think we're hearing of more cases of premature arthritis, that sort of thing. And you'll hear arthritis causes pain. Do you agree with that? That is one of the great fallacies that exist. There is no such thing as arthritis, osteoarthritis causing pain. Let's just be very clear. Osteoarthritis is different from rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, any of these things, which are autoimmune debate, uh, autoimmune based and inflammatory. Osteoarthritis is you're gonna, this is going to blow everybody's mind when you hear this. Mm-hmm. Osteoarthritis occurs because of the fact that going back to our premise, when you have all your muscles and they're balanced, generally balanced because they're all being used. If you look at a joint, it's comprised of two joint surfaces with a space between them, and that's how a joint is set up. Now, when you have strength and balance of muscle, those two joint surfaces maintain 100% congruency. They are perfectly in line, and the joint works perfectly. Oh, but when you end up with weakness or imbalance, now those joint surfaces are no longer aligned. So maybe 80% of the joint surfaces are congruent, taking still 100% of the force through the joint. That's not a good equation. What's going to happen is the cartilage on the surface of the bone is going to wear down. Right. Yeah. When that cartilage wears down, bone is exposed. The osteoarthritic process is that point at which bone is exposed and you either have continuing wearing down of the joint surface or excessive bone growth, such as bone spurs. So let's be very clear osteoarthritis, herniated disc, stenosis, meniscal tears, labral tears, all of these things being found on the MRI are not causes, they're resultants of the very same thing, eliciting your pain, which is weakness or imbalance of muscle. How's that? That is interesting. That's it's kind <laughs> of in reverse of what everybody's been told, too. That is because people think that when you see something, mm-hmm. At the time of a symptom, it is to assert it is the cause without ever attempting to see, is that a justifiable statement? And the reality is it's not. Wow. This is really food for thought. I know that we do have to go to break here. I hate to do that, but you've got our listeners thinking like, that's not what I was told. I think that uh, this doctor's onto something. And, And I definitely want to, in the next segment, talk about your YAS method, because I know our listeners especially, who deal with chronic pain and many are facing surgeries they don't want to have, this is really good information for them to have on what they can do about their chronic pain because who wants to live with pain? I mean, it it is just so counterproductive and it makes life totally miserable, you know? Absolutely. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNCradio.live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. I'm talking with Dr. Mitchell Yass. 
He's a renowned pain expert, and he's developed the YAS method for diagnosing and treating chronic pain. We're going to get into more details and unpack more information on that coming up in the next segment. So stay tuned right here on TNCRadio.live. TNC Radio.Live is proud to carry the Steve Summers Overnight Drive Show. TNC Radio.Live is dedicated to commercial drivers. We offer the news, traffic, and weather you need, and the entertainment, sports, talk, music, and celebrity interviews you want to hear 24-7. We have original shows and trucker podcasts that feature some of your favorites, like Ice Road Alex Demogorski and America's Truck and Sweetheart Marcia Campbell. TNC Radio.Live is convenient and designed for professional drivers. The best part is we're free, and you can listen anywhere you are on the road. With just one tap, you can tune into Steve Summers and us right on your phone. Simply download our app by going to app.tncradio.live. That's app.tncradio.live. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio.Live. I'm Shelly Johnson, and I'm talking with Dr. Mitchell Yass. He's a well-known pain expert. He developed the Yass method for diagnosing and treating chronic pain. Dr. Yass, your method sounds like a dream come true. You said you can alleviate pain for people within weeks. I mean, that is something that I think people be breaking down your door. <laughs> Well, if they knew this existed, that would be true. <laughs> but but it's very hard for people to know this exists because there's such noise out there and they're being bombarded from so many different angles regarding the nonsensical stuff that exists because the existing system doesn't work and everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon, uh, bandwagon and sell somebody something. Sure. Um, so I, I, let me just, if I may, uh, I just want to try to give an, a metaphor for my method um, that I think the trucker will truly appreciate and understand. And mm -hmm. I think it'll help them understand why they really have to disregard the MRI. So um, we're going to take a We're going to look at this car and I'm going to take a sledgehammer and I'm going to beat in the driver's side door panel. Then I'm going to take air out of all the tires. OK, mm -hmm. so beat in the driver's side door panel, take air out of all the tires. I get into the car, turn the car on, put the car in drive. The car doesn't work. I say, what's wrong? You go to your orthopedist and neurologist, and they're going to say, well, clearly the door panel's bus busted in, right? A blind man can see it's busted in. I can take lots of pictures of it, right? And they're going to keep telling you it's the door panel, and they want to replace the door panel, and they want to simonize the door panel, and they want to repaint the door panel. They're going to just keep going because clearly the door panel can be seen as a deficit, right? But what is the symptom the right. symptom is that you're in the car, the car is on, the car is in drive, and it's not moving. How does a busted door panel relate to those symptoms? Yeah, it doesn't. Right. Yeah. But what does? All four flat tires. Exactly. Yeah. So you could spend the next 10 years, if you want, replacing and doing whatever you want with that door panel. But unless you look at the symptoms, which recognize that the all four tires being flat is causing your inability to move and fill the tires with air, you're never going to get out of that location. That is what you must understand. Stop accepting that because something is identified that simply isn't its norm and therefore it is the cause. This example should help you understand why that is a simple, baseless mechanism for diagnosing. You must interpret the symptoms themselves. That is critical to understand. Okay? Mm-hmm. OK, so let's go to a couple of places where I would love the trucker to be able to do something applicable and take something away. OK, so they're sitting in their truck and they, they may have a little bit of back pain, but it's maybe tolerable, maybe none. And all of a sudden they stop at the rest stop and they go to try to stand up and bam, spasm. They cannot straighten up or it takes 20, 30 minutes to straighten up. Right. That's the problem they're having. So they're told it's a herniated disc. Well, the disc just sits between vertebrae. And if it's sticking out a little bit, I don't understand what this has anything to do with your ability to straighten up. The ability to straighten up pertains to the relationship between your torso and your thigh, right? 
What we're trying to do, if you're sitting, is that you have a 90 degree angle between your torso and your thigh. And when you go to stand up, it's 180 degrees, right? right. Yeah. So we're changing the hip angle. So therefore, the inability to straighten up must relate to the hip region, not a freaking disc just because someone found one. And what mm -hmm. happens is that there is a muscle called the psoas muscle, which attaches from the lumbar spine. All five lumbar spine runs diagonally through the abdominal region and attaches to the hip joint. Well, if you sit long enough, you're going to shorten that muscle so that it's incapable of wanting to suddenly go back to its normal length. That's the muscle that's in spasm. That's the muscle that's pulling excessively on your lumbar spine. That's why you have lower back pain. Okay. Okay. So this guy sounds like he's insane or maybe he knows what he's talking about. So what, wh how can I check this? All right. Well, all you have to do is once you're able to stand up, Try to take one of your feet, hold on to something with one hand, and take one of your feet with your other hand and just try to pull your heel towards your butt and see if that's an easy thing to do. Or do you have mega tightness at the front of your thigh and kind of at the very upper portion where the torso reaches the thigh? If you do, then by definition, that's a tightened hip flexor, and you could just hold that for a short period of time, 15, 20 seconds, do it on both sides and see if your back feels better. If your back feels better by stretching your quads and hip flexors, doesn't that mean that the cause of the pain, the actual pain is coming from your quads and hip flexors being shortened? It would make sense. That, that right? makes sense to me. Yeah. Right. So all you once you do that, you could discount anything you've heard from the medical system, acknowledge it's a muscular cause, learn how to strengthen the butt muscle and the hamstring, which are the opposing muscles. Ta-da! You never have back pain and you drive as much as you want. You get in and out of your truck whenever you want without any pain or inability. Would you recommend that kind of an exercise every day? Oh, so Yas Method exercises are always done three times a week. Um, and the reason is because Yas Method exercises actually incorporate resistance. You cannot make a muscle stronger, but without causing it to adapt to a greater and greater resistance. There's a mechanism that you would need to understand how to do, and that's part of my method and part of what we do in Zoom sessions or in person sessions in, in Jacksonville, Florida, where I am. Mm -hmm. And once you learn how to do the progressive resistance, you're on your own. You don't need me anymore. You're now empowered to take this uh, under control, and you not only resolve the pain, but prevent it from reoccurring. Oh, that's marvelous. That's what this is all that's about. If it's a muscular want. cause, yeah. if it's a muscular cause, who has the ability to make you stronger? Only you. So sure. once you have the capacity to understand what to do, bam, you're done. You have control. You prevent this from ever reoccurring. You keep a resistance band in, in your truck and whenever you stop, you go to a hotel room three times, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You're doing that exercise, those couple of exercises, and you never have your problem again. Wow. How long does this all take? Three times uh, a week. So to do a series, the typical person has three to four muscles that need to be strengthened, which are responsible for their pain. Usually 30 to 45 minutes to do the series of three exercises or four exercises, three sets of 10 repetitions with a minute rest in between each set. Yeah. So we're talking less than an hour, three times a week to prevent you from ever having pain again. I would think that this would also mean that people don't have to take any inflammatories in that sort of thing, because that's another thing that's blamed for pain. Oh, you've got inflammation. Yeah, that's a, so that's a really good point. I'd like to bring that up. That's about a four, five, six billion dollar industry inflammation. Mm -hmm. And so everybody is told pain and inflammation are synonymous, that all pain is inflammatory and inflammation is always pain. So here's the point to say a kidney stone is an in inability of a cholesterol molecule to run through a tube. No inflammation. A heart attack is cell death. No inflammation. If I pinch you, it hurts because I squeezed the pain receptors in your skin, no inflammation. So it is irrefutable that pain and inflammation are not synonymous, that pain can exist without inflammation. And when it's a muscular strain, it's simply pain without inflammation. If inflammation is present, such as when you stra sprain your ankle, uh, if you have the flu, if you have a bee sting, if, I, if you have a contusion, what you see are pain, swelling, heat, and redness. Right. Those are the four symptoms associated with inflammation. 
So if in the area where you're having pain, you don't see swelling, heat, redness, it ain't inflammation creating your symptom. It is a waste of time to take an anti-inflammatory. And by the way, the only reason non-steroidal anti-inflammatories actually do something for your pain is they act as a sedative in your brain. It's affecting your brain's awareness of the brain, of the pain. It's doing nothing at the point of pain. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's a fact. Now, where do people find your information, Dr. Yas? Um, and you also work with people on Zoom. This is something that drivers would like to hear, I'm sure. Yeah, so um, in 2015, I did a PBS special. And to do this special, you do a gift pack. And one of the gifts was going to be a book. So we ended up hooking up with Hay House, which is the second largest publisher in the world. And so my books are sold here, Canada, England, Australia, India, and South Africa. And quite remarkably, my third book was actually translated into Cantonese in in Taiwan. So that's very humbling for me. But as that began to happen, I'm getting contacted by people internationally, and no one wants to fly to Jacksonville, Florida for three or four days when I can get them out of pain through Zoom sessions. So that's when the process began. And um, absolutely. So what happens, I have a website called livewithoutpainsplural.com, livewithoutpains.com. And there's a schedule now button on the homepage. You just click on that. You get the option of doing an in-person uh, session in Jacksonville, Florida, or a Zoom session and complete the information. And that sets up the, the appointment. And all you need, the beautiful part with my system, is all you need is a resistance band in a chair, and that's going to be the equipment we need to get you stronger once we figure out which muscles are responsible for your symptoms and have to be strengthened. And you can help with all parts of the body where the pain is. Absolutely. I've done everything from headaches to plantar fasciitis. Okay. (laughs) For for those who don't know, what is plantar fasciitis? That's a hard word to say. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, uh, let me tell you something. I bet you a lot of these truckers have that. So plantar fasciitis is where there's this connective tissue band that runs from the balls of the feet to the heel. And when the arch is stressed and you don't have proper support of the arch, you will separate the space, the distance between the balls of the feet and the heel. And this could irritate the plantar fascia's attachment at the heel, and you get this pain at your heel. Okay. Okay? Now, because it's called plantar fasciitis, people think it's a structure and something has to be done structurally. So you have to go back and say, well, what's causing the plantar fascia to become irritated? Well, we said it's lack of support of the arch. Well, what's the lack of support of the arch? Well, go back to the hip area. If that gluteus medius muscle is weak, it cannot keep your pelvis level to the ground. Only when the pelvis is level or horizontal do you weight bear through the middle of the foot. Right. If the glute meat is strained, the opposite side of the pelvis will begin to fall and it takes your center of mass and moves it over the inside of the foot Makes where sense. the arch is, stressing the muscles that support it, causing it to strain leading to the separation between the balls of the feet and the heel, leading Mm -hmm. to plantar fasciitis. So shockingly, the YAS method has proven that the cause of plantar fasciitis is a weak gluteus medius muscle at the hip region. Interesting. Well, I know a lot of people are going to want to reach out to you, Dr. YAS. What is your website again? It is live without pains, plural, livewithoutpains.com. And my name is, I hate to say it, but it's the only way to really remember. My last name's really easy. It's actually ass with a Y in front of it. <laughs> That's horrible to say, but I was tortured as a child because of it. Oh, so <laughs> my, yeah, my email address is Dr. Mitch, D-R-M-I-T-C-H at Mitchell Yass, Y-A-S-S dot com. So D-R-M-I-T-C-H at M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L-Y-A-S-S dot com. I think if you just, if, you, if you're not getting any of it and you just get the ass, if you literally just Google Dr. Yas or Dr. You'll probably end up finding all this information <laughs> on the Internet. <laughs> your perspective and your insight is, uh, I think, going to be a lifesaver for a lot of people because it really does kind of run a, in contrast to what everybody's being told. And if there's a way to finally take control get rid of the pain, and even prevent it. That's exactly what people are looking for. 
Everyone's desperate for that. Everybody was looking for that. And, and if that was happening, why is there a chronic pain epidemic? I need people to recognize that if this is existing, it probably indicates something is wrong systemically with the way pain is diagnosed and treated. And the evidence is overwhelming. I am a contrarian. I, like I am the that. guy who is to the opposite of that. And yet mm -hmm. my method was actually derived empirically by treating people and finding the ways to make them better. That's how I developed the theories that I use to treat people. And that's why it works. Correct. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Yas, for being on the show. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Shelley. It's been great. And I hope that truckers see that there is an answer and they can be pain-free and live the lives they choose. So thank you for having me. Wonderful. You've been listening to the Truckers Network radio show here on TNC Radio Live. Be sure to stay tuned for more great entertainment, more great information. We've got a great lineup coming up. Stay tuned to TNC Radio Live. Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio Live and the Truckers Network radio show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at TNC Radio Live. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast of the Truckers Network Radio Show.